purpose and be glad in it. I want to invite your attention to a very familiar passage of Scripture in the Gospel of John, John chapter number 6, if you would, as we will share together in the reading of the Word of God from verse number 59 down to verse number 71 of the Gospel of John chapter number 6. And we appreciate your presence so much in this place uh, on uh, today. This has been a very busy and a very uh, exhausting week for your pastor. I'm going to just talk and teach and give my lesson today, and we're going to rock and roll and get out of here today, okay? Amen, amen. If you have it, I'm going to read the odd, and you would read the even numbers of the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 6, verse 59. It says, These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? It is a spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And he said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me, except it were given unto him of my Father. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Verse 71, and he spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. As the Spirit of God will grant guidance and grace today, I want to talk and teach from this simple thought and theme, fan versus followers of Christ, fans versus followers of Christ. You may claim your seats in the presence of our God. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Our Father and our God, we honor you, we praise you, we magnify you. We thank you even now, Father, for your presence in this place and for the gathering of your people in this place. And Father, to that end, now we ask of you that you will speak to us in this place. Even as you speak, may our ears be attentive and attuned to hearing what your Spirit is saying unto the church. And Father, it is our heart's desires not just to be mere hearers of your word, but more importantly, to be doers of your word. So to that end, now, Father, we ask of you that you will saturate this place with your presence. I pray now, Father, that you will use me fully and freely. I yield myself now as an earthen vessel. I thank you for the deposit, for the treasure that you've deposited within. Now save and deliver, edify even those now through the preaching and the teaching of your word. It is in Jesus Christ's name we pray it. And all the saints of the Lord said, amen. Fans versus followers of Christ. During our Quad City Revival, we shared with you that there is a starch difference between being a fan versus being a follower. A fan can be defined as one who is an enthusiastic admirer of a particular celebrity or a particular team or an endeavor, whereas a follower is someone who is committed, someone who is faithful, not one who is just merely one who admires, but one who has come, who's come to a point in place that they have declared their allegiance. The reality is simply this, that Christ's desire of you and I is that we not just merely be fans, but more importantly, that we become followers. It is Dr. Cal Eidelman in his book, Not a Fan, where he gives this very insightful statement, and I quote, my concern is that many of our churches in America has gone from being sanctuaries to becoming stadiums. And every week, all the fans come to the stadium where they cheer for Jesus, but has no interest in truly following him. He says it is like church. Church today is similar to a stadium in which people pack out the stadium to cheer on their team. They are fans. But none of them, according to Eidemann, is willing to follow Christ. And this passage that is before us, this narrative that is before us, actually draws a line of demarcation. It delineates between those who are fans, enthusiastic admirers, 
in contrast to those who are followers. It really just supposes, it provides a juxtaposition, if you would. It places side by side the fan and follower so that there can be an intense comparison or contrast of the two to the degree and to the extent that we will look introspectively within ourselves to determine whether or not we're fans or merely, whether or not we're mere fans or are we really followers. The historical context of John chapter 6, of course, is during the time in which Jesus fed 5,000, excluding the women and children. The Bible declares in the opening chapter, verse number 2, that many of the people that were around in Christ were following him as it relates to the miracles that he had performed. They were amazed, they were mesmerized by his miracles and how he was able to heal those who were diseased. As they continue to follow him, the text makes mention that they come to a particular region in which they had been faithful and walking along with Christ for quite some time. Jesus now says to Philip, where can we go and find bread that we might feed them? The text says in verse number 6 of chapter 6 that he posed this interrogative to Philip that he might prove him, that he might test him. The Bible then declares that Philip gives a response saying there's not enough money in the budget to feed all 5,000 of these men, excluding the children. Why not just dismiss them and send them on their merry way? The Bible then declares that Andrew apparently had canvassed the crowd and had discovered that there was a lad who had his lunch. He had fish and five hush puppies in his bag. The Bible declares that he brought the fish and hush puppies to Jesus. Jesus somehow in some way performed a miracle. My head cannot explain it, but my heart believes it. He took the five hush puppies and two pieces of fish and fed 5,000 to the extent that after they were satisfied, their stomachs, according to the text, were filled. The Bible says that they gathered the fragments, that which remained, the leftovers, and had enough to fill six, 12 baskets. Watch what happens after Jesus performs this miracle. Verse 14 and 15 says, and they were willing to make him king by force. The Bible declares that because of this mesmerizing miracle that the master had performed, the multitude said, that's the type of king we want. Let's not look for another. We want a king that can feed, not a king that will lead. We want a king that can provide, not a king that will preside. Make Jesus our king. Jesus says, however, I have not come just to be one that you enthusiastically admire because I'm able to do mesmerizing miracles. He says, I don't want just fans coming behind me because of my supernatural performances. And the Bible says that Jesus departed. He broke away from the crowd, went into a mountain, leaving the multitude behind. The disciples now gathered into their vessel, went across the Sea of Tiberias, came over, comes over now to the city of Capernaum. Jesus then comes walking on the water in the midst of the storm, gives them safe passage to the other side. Soon as Jesus and the disciples get to the other side, guess who shows up? They discover that Jesus had left them behind, and they now, according to the text, this great multitude of people that had just recently had been fed and had seen him perform miracles, they got into their boats. And the text declares in verse 24, the last clause, and they came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. So, oh, no, Jesus, you're not getting away from us that easy. You've just fed us, and you've just blessed us, and you've performed this miracle, and we shared with you we want you to be our king, and you think you're just going to run off to the sunset? Got in the boat, went over to the other side, met Jesus. Watch what Jesus says to them in verse number 25. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, teacher that is, when did you get over here? Jesus, verse 26, he responded and replied, Verily, verily, I say unto you, let's cut through the chase. You seek me not because you saw miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and you were filled. Jesus said, let's, let's not even play the game. You're not coming behind me because I performed a miracle which showcased my deity. But you're coming behind me because I have satisfied your hunger. And all you want from me is some more fish and hush puppies. Jesus said, I'm, I'm shutting down this tailgate party. That's it. It's over. He says, here it is, verse 27, labor not, work not for the meat that has an expiration date that perish 
but for the meat that endureth for everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. And not just to you, but the Father has even sealed even the Son of Man. He says, I've come to satisfy a deeper hunger. He says, and I've utilized this miracle as nothing more than an appetizer for you to come to seek me for a greater need. Not for the temporal, but for that which is eternal. Not to just satisfy your carnal cravings, but rather to satisfy your soul longings. He says, understand that you're chasing after bread, after meat that will expire. He said, and here's the problem I have with you. You're really just coming after me because you want to be a fan. You're not interested, really, in being a follower. So now the question must be posed, what's the profile of a fan as we look at the text? First of all, consider the populace, the fan. The fans, they are first of all enamored by the wonders of Christ. Enamored, they are mesmerized, they are arrested, they are apprehended by the wonders of Christ. The populace, the fans, was not looking for miracles, they were looking for meals. They sought Jesus not so much for wonders, but for some sort of religious warfare in which Jesus would fill their stomachs and would ease their hunger. This group represents those who follow Jesus for purely selfish reasons. They try him only to see what he can offer to them. As long as their bellies are full and as long as they feel good, they're willing to hang around him. However, as soon as Jesus begins to give a call upon their life, a call of sacrifice, a call of service, a call of selflessness, they soon turn back and were willing to walk away. These disciples are trying to somewhat experiment with Jesus. They are, can be considered as experimental disciples. They're wanting to follow Jesus as long as he can give and doesn't take, as long as he can bless and doesn't break, as long as he brings the light and does not bring demands. They are willing to follow him because they're enamored by the wonders of Christ. Not only are they enamored by the wonders of Christ, but second of all, these fans are exasperated by the words of Christ. Jesus cuts through the chase. He says, again, the tailgate part is over. He says, let's get down to the real deal. Watch what he says. I am the bread of life. If you eat of me, you shall never hunger, shall never thirst. He says that manna that came down from heaven as Moses was leading you in the wilderness is nothing more than a type or a picture of what, I came, what I've come to bring to you. I've come to satisfy your hunger. I am the bread of life. And then Jesus says something that is rather profound that the text actually says offended them. Jesus says, well, now eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. He's not referring to cannibalism, but rather what he is saying from a figurative perspective that if indeed you're going to be a follower, you must receive me by faith. The Bible declares that after Jesus made the statement, verse 52 the Bible says that these Jews were exasperated. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink of his blood, ye have no life in you. Jesus says, in essence, you must partake of me. It is not so much the mundane materials that you are consuming that will satisfy you. He says you need something that has an, an eternal implication that can satisfy that deep longing within you. He says, eat of my flesh, drink of my blood, receive me, partake of me. And then look at what the text says in verse 60 and 61. When the disciples heard these things that he taught, according to verse 59, in the synagogue there in Capernaum, the Bible says that they said this is a hard saying. Who can hear this? The Bible then says, verse 61, and Jesus knew within himself the disciples had murmured. At it, he said, does this offend you? He said, oh, now you are offended because I've given you the real terms as it relates to being a follower. That no longer am I here to be your cosmic butler. Say, here's, here's the real deal. Here's the real deal. Partake of me. 
And now they are totally exasperated. They, they want nothing to do with this Jesus that says, in essence, that I'm the bread of life. They are irritated. They are annoyed. They are exasperated. Let me ask, has there ever been a time in your life you come to church and you've listened to the tall demands and calls of being a disciple and you sat there in the pew, you read your Bible in private devotion and you were exasperated after you read what Jesus requires of you to be a follower, such as love your neighbors? <laughs> Pray for them that despitefully use you and saw manner of evil against you. Here it is. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Forgive those who have trespassed against you. After you hear these tall demands of Christ, how often is it the case that we say that's too hard to do? It's not that the sayings are hard as much as it is their hearts are hard. Because whenever you have a hard heart, it's hard to do what he says do. A fan is someone, of, again, who's simply enamored by the wonders of Christ. A fan is someone who is quickly exasperated by the words of Christ. But a fan is also one who errs in embracing the work of Christ. The problem with these fans in the text, they had no clue. They were misguided, misled, misinformed, ill-informed as it relates to the mission of Christ. He clearly articulates his mission here in verse number 50 and 51. He says, this is the bread which comes down from heaven. That phrase, which comes down from heaven, is a statement that implies the incarnation. And he says, and that a man may eat thereof and not die. He says, verse 51, listen to this self-disclosing statement of Christ. He says, I am the living bread. In contrast to the bread that would perish in verse 27, he says, I'm the living bread that, come down from, that came down from heaven. If any man will eat this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I would give is my flesh, which I should give for the life of the world. The fans, those who are following Christ, they, are, they have erred in embracing the work of Christ, they were mistaken as it relates to why Jesus came. He didn't come just to give sight to the blind. He didn't come just to speak peace to the stormy sea. He didn't come just to enable the deaf to hear and the lame to walk. Better yet, he did not even come just to feed 5,000. He came to offer himself as the bread of life to a hungry world that is perishing. And the fans missed it. Not only were the fans erring in embracing the words of Christ, not only were the fans exasperated, offended by the words of Christ, not only were the fans merely enamored by the wonders of Christ, but watch what happens to fans. Here is how it ends. Fans are erratic in their walk with Christ. Erratic simply meaning... On and off, sometimey, flaky, fluctuates, fickle, finicky. You just never know. Hot, cold, half time, part time, erratic. Here this Sunday may not come to next month. <laughs> Walk today, chill out tomorrow. Erratic unpredictable. Watch, watch, watch the text. Watch this. Watch this. In chapter, chapter 6, verse 2, he performed the miracles. Everybody's around. These 5,000. He goes to the other side of the sea. They get in a boat looking for him. Where, 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 where is Jesus? Where is Jesus? Where is Jesus? Get to the other side. Jesus said, that's it. Tailgate is over. I ain't feeding y'all no more. I'm finished with that. Shut down the party. He says, now I'm the bread of life. Do you want me now? Watch what happened in verse 66. The Bible says, sound like you're talking to church folks today. And from that time, many of his disciples went back. He said, he said you ain't feeding no more, that's it? Got back in the boat. Went across the sea. Went back over to their home, said, that's it. 
went back and walked no more. That's what fans do. Fans are erratic. See, that's, that's the danger of this prosperity gospel. That as long as he provides, as long as he uh, satisfies my carnal cravings, oh, I'm willing to follow him, but as soon as he gives the high call to sacrifice, to service, to selflessness, to eat of his body, oh, no, I ain't up with that. I didn't sign up for that. It's, it's, almost, it's almost like we have become addicted to this uh, infomercial type of Jesus. Uh, you know, I typically wake up around 4, 30, 5 o'clock in the morning. And the funny thing is when you uh, turn on the news, there's a bunch of uh, infomercials, the ninja knives. <laughs> I mean, just, I mean, you, you, I mean, you name it. They come up with some, you just sit there sometime. Who would sit up and think of something this crazy? <laughs> but we got this type of uh, infomercial type of Jesus. That is, many are they that want to just try him. They want to end home risk-free for 30-day trial. And if they're not completely satisfied with their religious decision, they want to return him with no obligations. The problem with that kind of thinking is that Jesus is a savior that is to be embraced, not a product that is to be tested. Jesus is not something that should be experimental in your life, but rather he should be someone that you accept and receive as savior of your life because if he's just merely experimental, you will end up deserting and defecting and departing from him. Now the question must be posed. We, we see the populace, the fans, how they react, how they are enamored, how they're exasperated, how they're, they're willing and swift to err, how they're erratic in their walking with Christ. But let's look at Peter and the posse. I'm closing right here. Look right there at verse 67. The text says, Then Jesus said unto the twelve, I love it, I love it, I love it. Look, look, look at verse 66 again. They walked away, they went back, said, We ain't walking with you no more, Jesus. That's it. Note what Jesus does not do. He doesn't chase after any of them. It's almost like Jesus saying, peace. <laughs> Bye. I, I'm, not, I'm not about to chase after you. You know, I'm, I'm not, I'm, no, I'm not about to do anything. Because first of all, your motives are wrong. He said, you, 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 you're, you're not with me. You're not for me. Because you have a real sense of a need for me. All you want is your carnal cravings to be satisfied. Jesus, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in that business. That's, that's not why I came. I didn't, I didn't come just to give you a house and a car and a nice job. I didn't come to give you the modern day equivalent of, of bread. See, that stuff perish. He said, don't, he said don't, don't chase after stuff that rust, rust and, and moths and thieves can take. Something that is eternal. And they walk no more with them. Jesus says, it, it's, it's, it's really interesting from, from a church growth perspective because, you know, at this particular moment, he has a 5,000 membership congregation of just men, not including the women and children, I mean, I mean, his numbers can probably be close to about 10,000, 12,000 when you add on all the little kids. It's just men that, that, Matthew, uh, that uh, John is, is counting right here. And Jesus automatically in one day went from a mega church pastor <laughs> in one day down to just having 12 members. <laughs> and then he turned to the last 12 members he has. He turns to them, he says, hey, What's up with y'all? <laughs> Will you leave me as well? See, because I, I haven't come for fans, folks who are erratic, exasperated, who errs, who's enamored. He says, I'm looking for followers. Watch what Peter says. I'm finished. I'm finished. He speaks to the whole team, the whole posse of 12. Will you also go? 
Then Peter answered him. Peter is the spokesperson. This is one of two great confessions of Peter. Uh, this is the first. The second one, of course, is when uh, Jesus posed the question, who do men say that I am, the Son of Man am? And uh, they responded, some say you're Elijah, some say you're Jeremiah, some say you're uh, one of those other prophets. Peter says, oh, no, 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 I, I, know, I, I know who you are. Jesus said, who, who, who do you say that I am? Peter says, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the second. Here's the first great confession of Peter. Listen to this confession of Peter. Then Peter answered and said, Lord, I'm speaking on behalf of the whole band, the whole posse. To whom shall we go? Where, where, where can you go? Who else? Verse 68 has the word of eternal life. Peter says, I know everybody else have left you, have walked away. All the fans are gone, but we believe. Not only do we believe, but we are sure that thou art that Christ, the son of the living God. But everybody in the crowd is not necessarily a part of the crew. Because verse 70 says, but there's another one in the 12 named Judas, who's the devil. Uh, one out of every 12 is a devil in most churches. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. Look down your pew right now. Look down your pew. If you got 12 folks sitting, that's one of them on that pew, more than likely. Because Jesus said, you can even be among my disciples and still have hell in you. Uh, let me go ahead. Let me go ahead. Let me. I'm going I'm to resist the urge of chasing that one. What's the profile now of a follower? We've seen the profile of a fan. What's the profile of a follower? Here it is. Four things real quick. A follower, first of all, is steadfast in their devotion to Christ. I love it. I love it. Everybody else has walked away. Peter said, we ain't going nowhere. We're steadfast in our devotion. And their devotion is steadfast in at least three ways. First of all, the center of their devotion is steadfast. Note, if would, how uh, Peter identifies the center of, 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 of the team's devotion. He says, to whom, let the church say whom. That word whom is referring to Christ. He is referring to Christ as the center of their devotion to whom? Who else can we go to? There's nobody else that can do for us as you've, as you've done for us. There's, 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 you're, you're irreplaceable. There's no other alternatives. There's no other options we have. He's the only center, core of our devotion to whom? Because every movement has center. Catholics, they center on Mary, all hail Mary. Mormons, they focus on Joseph Smith. Muslims, they focus on Muhammad. Charismatic, they focus on the Holy Spirit. The modern Protestant wants to give themselves the main attention. But true disciples of Christ, those who are followers, those who are devoted, they recognize that the center of their devotion is Christ. Their faith, their doctrine, their worship is Christocentric. Let the church say Christocentric. That's a cute little theological term that means Christ-centered. Everything about the believer's life is Christ-centered. Peter said we can't go anywhere because he's the center of our devotion. And if you ever have the wrong center, it will always affect the circumference and everything else. He's the center. He is what keeps us rooted, what keeps us grounded. He's not my job, not my creature comforts, not, not the fish sandwiches and hush puppies that he provides. That's, that's not what has centered me. Christ is the center. Ah. <sighs> You, 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 you've, you've heard that acrostic for uh, joy, J-O-Y, Jesus, others, yourself. How many have heard that? Oh, you have? Okay. <laughs> I thought that was, well, yeah, that's a little cute little statement. You know, they say, you know, how do you have joy? You have joy, Jesus, J, others, and yourself. Well, that's something somewhat, I can go along with it, but 
but I prefer, you know, Jesus, as opposed to an O, o I mean, put a zero, nothing, and yourself. Because real joy is just Jesus and you. See, you mess up, you mess up your joy if you put others in the center. Somebody right now, you, 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 you sit now, <laughs> Um, acting as if you can't relate with that particular point. Part of the reason you don't have joy right now is because you messed around and you put someone between you and Jesus. And you made the assumption that they could do for you what Jesus can only do. He's the only one that can satisfy you. He's the center. Not your career, not, not even your cute, cuddly children. Because they will break your heart. Not your spouse. Especially not your job, as jacked up as this economy is. You better have another center. He's the center of our devotion. He's not only the center of our devotion, but look at the constancy of their devotion. To whom shall we go? It is almost as if, yeah, we got the option. Yeah, we, we could consider it, but, but outside of Christ, who else? What else? Look at the pressure between verse six, uh, six, six, verse six, seven. Look, in the prior verse, a multitude has left. Can you imagine the pressure that the posse must be under? Uh, it, it's called group dynamics, you know, because typically the, 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 the movement and the direction of the group can influence our behavior if we don't have some conviction. But they stood firmly in their faith in Christ, though everybody else walked away. The constancy of their devotion, the center of their devotion, but look now at the confession of their devotion. Peter says, Lord, you ought to underscore, circle, highlight that one four-letter word, Lord. Because brothers and sisters, that is it. That is what makes the difference when we can come to the point and place of recognizing him as being Lord. What does Lord mean? You're in charge. You're a ruler. You're the master. Lord. But not only do we see that they are steadfast in their devotion, but second of all, they're steadfast in their doctrines of Christ and what they know about Christ. When you look at the profound statement that, uh, of confession that Peter makes, he says, For thy art that Christ, the Son of the living God, to whom else can we go that has the word of eternal life? There's at least three statements that Peter makes as it relates to Christ. He first of all says that Christ, Jesus that is, is the Messiah. He makes a statement of Jesus as Messiah, thou art that Christ. It is, it is a statement, you're that Christ. You're the one that had been anticipated centuries ago when Moses wrote the Pentateuch, when the psalmist began to write the Messianic Psalms, when Isaiah began to talk about that one would come who would be the wonderful counselor, the prince of peace, how the government shall be placed upon his shoulder. You're that, you're that Christ. That word Christ means you're the anointed one. You're the Messiah that we have been long anticipating and awaiting. He recognized his Messiahship. But he not only said that Jesus is Messiah, but he also said that Jesus is also God. Look at verse 6 to 9. For he's the son of the living God. That's a statement of the deity of Christ. Of the deity of Christ. That particular point is so important because we live in this culture and in this context that people oftentimes try to challenge us on the deity of Christ. They're trying to make us think that he's just a good prophet, that he's just an ordinary good man, that he was a wonderful teacher. No, he's much more than just a prophet. He was much more than just a teacher. He is the son of the living God. Then he also says Jesus is not only the Messiah, not only God, but he's also the Savior. To whom? Can we go that has the words of eternal life, steadfast in their devotion, steadfast in their doctrines? But here it is, see, steadfast in their decision. L listen to how uh, Peter, as he speaks on behalf of the, uh, the posse, how he's so dogmatic. He's dogmatic. He says, and we believe. 
Not only do we believe, verse 6 and 9, and we are sure. Catch that phrase. We believe. and We are sure. We believe. We are sure. He is dogmatic. The dogmatism of Peter. He says, we, we, we know it. You know too much about him. You can't make us doubt him. We believe and we are sure. Can you honestly say that you believe and that you are sure of the claims of Christ? Because if not, you would easily be distracted and derailed in your commitment of being a disciple. Now, I, I close, I close, I close. Peter says, I recognize two things about Christ, that he's the only source of truth. He's the only one that has the word of truth. He's the only source of truth, and he's the only savior to trust. He says, we, we believe, and we are sure. The interesting part about being a disciple of Christ, being a follower of Christ, not merely a fan, is that sometime as a follower, we fumble, we fall. A follower is not one who is flawless. Are there any followers in here that can testify? You know, there's been a time or two in my recent past, recent past within the past seven days. I mean, because you, you said, well, back in 2005. No, I'm talking about, I'm talking about last week. I wasn't as consistent in my walk. This very Peter who gives this great confession of faith was not flawless. He had his faults. You remember, remember Jesus is arrested. Peter is sitting by the fire. Jesus told him prior to his being arrested, you're going to deny me. You're going you're gonna to act like you don't even know me. Peter said, never, 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 never me. He says, probably all these other disciples, they may. He said, Lord, I'd die for you. I'd go to prison for you. So Jesus said, I'm telling you, for the cock crow, thrice, you're going to deny me. And Jesus is arrested. He's preparing to meet death. And they recognize Peter as being one of those disciples. They say, oh, that's one of those disciples. Peter says, oh, no, 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 not I. Another person said, oh, that's... That looked just like, that's one of the disciples. I've seen him with Jesus. Peter said, no, not, 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 not me. Look, look Damps a girl. Says, I can tell by the way you talk. I can, I can hear that southern accent. I, I can hear it. You're one of those disciples. Bible says, Peter, cussed the little poor child out. <laughs> he, he did. He, 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 I don't know what he said. Peter said something. Cock crew. Peter then lives under the weight of guilt and shame. Jesus now is being crucified. Can you see him that Friday being crucified? All the fans, those who he healed, those who, whom he had delivered, the ones he had given sight to, the 5,000 men that he had fed, ain't none of them at the cross. Because when it looks as if your team is about to lose, fans disappear on you. Have, you. have you ever gone to a game and at the tailgate party, you was all excited, you was all, I mean, made all the noise, got into the stadium, and your, and your team was on the losing side, and all of a sudden there's a, there's a, there's a hush. You don't got nothing to say now. You almost a tad bit embarrassed. You, you, I mean, if, if you was able to just take off that, that, that jersey that you was so boldly and so proudly wearing, you, I mean, you, you take the jersey off. Like, I'm, I'm just even ashamed to identify myself. I mean, almost, almost like how some of y'all was with Micah Vick. And now all of a sudden, I want to go to the game today. I, wanna, I mean, you weren't talking all that. Because it, it's amazing when a person make bad decisions, how folks then want to defect. But then as soon as God does for them 
what you oftentimes want him to do for you, redeem you, then all of a sudden the fans want to come out of nowhere telling you, man, you know, I was always down with him. I was always down with him. You're a lie. Same thing happened to Jesus. The ones he healed, the ones he delivered, they all walked away. Can't you see him on the cross? Suffer, bled, and died. It looked as if the team was about to lose on Friday. Oh, but Sunday morning, you know what happened. Our team, our hero, he defeated death. Yeah. Got up from the grave. My, 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 the late Moses D. Holmes, my, my pastor, he used to put it this way. He, they put my rock of ages in a rock and rolled a rock in front of the rock and sealed that rock with a rock. But on the third day morning, the rock of ages got up from the rock, walked up to the rock, rolled the rock from in front of the rock, stood up on the rock, and said, all power is in my hands. And that same Peter that talked about him so gloriously in the chapter, Acts, I mean, John chapter 6, same Peter. John chapter 21, he says, I'm going fishing. Look like, he, look like we done lost this game. I'm going, going, going fishing. And the Bible says, and all the disciples said, and we go fishing too. John chapter 21, they, they said, we, well, shall, if you're going fishing, we might as well go on fishing too. They went fishing. And on that day, Jesus stands on the shore of the very sea that they had crossed when he had fed them in John chapter 6. They're out there in the water fishing. Jesus said, hey, boys, you caught anything? Said, we haven't caught nothing. Been out here all day, haven't caught nothing. Jesus said, well, throw the net on the right side of the boat. Toss the net on the right side of the boat. And you know the rest of the Bible the story. The Bible said they caught such a great gathering of fish that they could not pull the nets into the boat. Bible then says that John said, I know who that is on the shore. That's the one that was crucified, but he's alive now. He's standing on the shore. And Jesus says to the disciples, y'all come and die. Peter jumps into the water, swims all the way to the shore. And the very thing that Peter and the posse was trying to catch at, at the lake, Jesus already had on the land. He had oh, a barbecue pit already hot, had some grilled tilapia on the grill, had some hushed puppies on the side. He said to them, what you've been looking for on the lake, I've already had for you provided. Is there anybody in here that can testify what I've been looking for? He already has. Then he said, Peter, he said, Peter, I, Peter, I, I, Peter, I got to go. I got to go. I got to go on to heaven. But Peter, I want to know something. Do you love me? Because you walked away, came back to this place I called you from. I called you from fishing. You going back fishing. Do you love me? Peter said, yeah, Lord, I love you. He said, well, feed my, feed my lambs. They kept walking. He said, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, yeah, Lord, I love you. He said, well, feed my sheep. They walked a little further down the shifty sand of the seashore. He said, Peter, do you love me? Peter got a little exasperated, a little bothered, a little hot around the collar. He said, Lord, I, we all talked about that. I told you I love you. He said, well, feed my sheep. He had Peter to confess three times his love because he denied him. He said, you denied me three times. I want you to confess that you love me. And the next time we see Peter is on the day of Pentecost. Bible says that the Holy Ghost showed up in that open room. There was in one place on one accord praying. Holy Ghost showed up and then Peter began to preach about the center of his devotion. Started preaching about Jesus and 3,000 souls were saved. You can't tell me that he cannot restore a preacher that has fallen. If he did it for Peter, he can do it for you. I don't care what the world says because they may want to try to remember the mistakes you made. Well, let me ask you this here. When was the last time you didn't make one? When was the last time you didn't make a bad decision? But is there anybody in here that can testify? I thank God that God is not like man. He can
can still restore. He can still save. He can still deliver. He can still turn your life around. Is there anybody in here that can testify he's done it for me? And if he was able to do it for me, he can do it for you. Now ask your neighbor, neighbor, identify yourself. Come on, come on, ask him, identify yourself. Tell him, tell him, are you a fan? Or are you a follower? Are you following Jesus just for the meal? Or are you following him for the message? Are you a fan? Or are you a follower? Go fishing, man. 